So the pursuit of uh, defining all of the narrative started with a tweet where I labeled some of the first four that came to my head. Uh, digital oil, internet bond, programmable money, tokenization platform. These are definitely some of the narratives that we've put out here at Bankless. Uh, and then after this tweet, I went on a hunt for, for even further validation of some of these same narratives and also adding new ones into this list. So I've come up with seven different perspectives, seven different angles. It's really six and a half uh, of ways of viewing Ether the asset and in no particular order. But uh, I did start with Ethereum as a tokenization platform first because I want to introduce that one as one of the most new and novel perspectives of the ETH pitch. Hmm. Uh, when you and, and I would write the ETH pitch, Ryan, we wouldn't really talk about Ethereum as a tokenization platform because if you're going to if you're gonna sell Ether, it's weird to start talking about Ethereum. You and I have been so focused on Ether, the asset, uh, but I don't think that nuance really matters if you only have 60 seconds. Right. So talking about what Ethereum does and talking about what its native currency Ether is, is almost synonymous for people who are actually kind of a naive to the fact that there is a difference there. Ether, Ether and Ethereum is basically the same thing. And tokenization as a candy line, as like a nerd snipe, as something that is enjoyed by many, many people, I think tokenization has broad appeal. And this is the perspective that Zach Ryan's Chainlink God puts into perspective here, where he says every single financial asset in the world will be tokenized on chain, tokenize the world, tokenize everything. This has been a meme that has persisted across all crypto cycles. He continues, there's no longer a question of if, but a question of when. Larry Fink, co-founder and CEO of BlackRock, has spoken publicly on numerous occasions about this inevitability. When regulatory clarity continues to be a pain point, Larry got both Bitcoin and ETH ETF approved by an anti-crypto SEC. Beyond that, BlackRock has launched its own tokenized fund on Ethereum mainnet, now at half a billion dollars AUM, invested in Circle, which issues USDC, invested in Securitize, one of the leading tokenized asset issuers, and used both Circles and Securitize tech stack to issue Buildle. There's no doubt in my mind that Buildle won't be the last fund BlackRock tokenizes on a public blockchain. Okay, so really leaning into the tokenization platform of Ethereum and also using the credibility of BlackRock. Mm -hmm. And Larry Fink, he's not a crypto native. He has no, like he's not. boomer customers. <laughs> yes. And so I think it's it's worth taking a leaf out of his book to understand how he is using and also pitching uh, ETH to his customers. And so Ethereum as a tokenization platform, I think needs to be a, a pretty core component of what any typical pitch about ETH is to TradFi. Okay, so that is the first of, of seven narratives that you think are contenders mm -hmm. to be one of the key narratives to to explain this, to give your 60 second uh, to mm -hmm. one minute, to two minutes, because David, spoiler alert, I think mine's closer to two minutes now. Yeah, it's longer, yeah. <laughs> so, uh -huh. so give me some grace there. But like uh, a tokenization platform, this is not usually the pitch you're saying to crypto natives, but might be right. like much more re uh, resonant to to TradFi. And indeed, it was certainly the, the pitch Larry, Larry Fink has given. And of course, you know the customers of Larry Fink are going to be the you know, the buyers of ETFs, right? Um, BlackRock is one of the main issuers of the Ethereum ETF. They're they're the leading issuer for the the Bitcoin ETF in terms of AUM. So like you'd think this guy knows how to sell it. So tokenized right. tokenization platform. It's not exactly going bankless, is it? But it right. is something that Ethereum provides, and maybe that's the leading narrative uh, for for this platform. Totally. And I think we all kind of felt something in our in our hearts when we learned about the idea of tokenization. And so it's, it's also re reminding people that, like, let's go back to your first days in crypto and like what really got you excited about crypto and tokenization. The idea of tokens is definitely up there. Well, you know, one thing I used to say when I was uh new to learning about Ethereum is that Bitcoin was a mono asset platform, just one mm -hmm. asset, just Bitcoin. And uh, Ethereum is a poly asset platform, multiple right. assets. Uh, right. So that that is a similar idea to tokenization, I guess. Let's go into narrative number two, angle number two. Ethereum is an app store. And this is coming out of Jeff Dorman, who put out a tweet saying, attention, BlackRock, VanEck, digital assets, and Bitwise. Once the ETH ETF goes live, please erase the words supercomputer, ultrasound money, internet bond from your memory. This does <laughs> not resonate with anyone. What does? Ethereum is an app store. And this is an angle that I've seen many people take. Ethereum is an app store. And it's, it's again, something that is familiar to people who do not have a crypto background, who don't know what Ethereum is. 
And so it's important to know that if we are pitching Ether to people with very little familiarity about what's going on in our world, then we need to pull some knowledge from other corners of their brain that they already have pre-existing knowledge. People know what an app store is. People know what a developer platform is. The, the idea of Ethereum as a tech platform that grows the more code is written and the more that developers build applications on it, that is something that is familiar to them. And we can like debate about like, well, is Ethereum really an app store? Hmm. And I think if you go down into the nuances, we're missing the forest for the trees. Sure. Like simply put, it's a developer platform just like the app store. And it grows in utility over time the more developers there are. I, I saw we we saw on a roll up recently, Vance Spencer pitched this pretty effectively in a conversation with uh, Bloomberg, where he um, said Ethereum is an app store, and then he mentioned some of the various uh, apps, and there was like this um, this slide shown on screen where it showed like Ave and like Compound and Maker and basically all of mm -hmm. these different logos for the the types of money apps. So I think th there is some familiarity there, and you can like point to actual apps that are deployed on the Ethereum App Store and say, "Oh, you want a collateralized loan? Go here. Oh, you want a stablecoin? Here's USDC. Go over here. Oh, you want it like a payment app? Go over here." And so I, I do think that is uh, pretty resonant. And as you say, David, like everyone knows what an App Store is. Is there a mm -hmm. human alive that you're pitching an Ethereum ETF uh, to that hasn't used the App Store? That doesn't have like dozens of apps on their on their smartphone, right? Like none of them. So this is a schematic that that kind of works and links to the last very successful compute revolution, which was the mobile revolution, and just like. Ethereum could be as big as the iPhone, you know, it, it, it calls into, into uh, mind that. I remember when we had Mark Cuban on the podcast during the middle of 2021, he was talking about giving us the perspective that he had where he was sharing with some of uh, some of his friends that, of his age who had downloaded Coinbase and was asking Mark Cuban, like, hey, where's like the DeFi apps? Where, where are all the apps? Uh, th thinking <laughs> that right, there was like an right. app tab in the Coinbase yeah. app, not understanding yeah. that it's actually a little bit like it's one dimension larger than that. Uh, but people are ready for this. Like people are ready for the app store perspective. They just, they, you know, you, in order to be perfectly accurate, you kind of have to tweak it and get a little bit more educated. But people are so ready to think of Ethereum as an app store. They are ready for that. The 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 way that the weakness of this uh, narrative, I think, is it it quickly falls down when you're, they're like, where's the app store? You can't like right. point them to one central location to go like download mm -hmm. their their app or go look at the reviews or you know just click and start using. It's just it's much more like the internet where it, you have to export on your own and there's rough edges. Right. There's not one central pristine app store type of experience brought to you by like some uh, commercialized UX uh, you know champion of the world. It's just very rough. I do agree with you that that's where the metaphor breaks down, but we also have to remember who the audience is. The audience is buying the Ether ETF, which you cannot use in any of the apps. Oh, they're not uh, users, like, so we don't. Have to they're worry not about users. That, they're not. Uh, they're not custody <laughs> anything. The pitch. Yeah, and so like they're like, oh, Ethereum is an app store. Great, I'll buy it. Like not considered. Like they're not actually going to like take it to the apps because they're buying the ETF, All and right. so they just want exposure, All right. which is well, great. Which is so like you can use some of the lack of sophistication of crypto nativity to actually make this pitch, I think, easier, not harder. Okay, so that's number two. Ethereum is an app store. What's number three, David? I called this a six and a half, not seven. Number three. This is coming from Ryan Rasmussen out of. Bitwise, who says Ethereum is an operating system and an app store for crypto applications. So really adding the operating perspective here to the Ethereum pitch. And I think this is where we also get the opportunity to really differentiate Bitcoin and teach whoever is hearing these pitches and give them a little bit stronger foundation. You know, Ethereum, it's not digital gold. Bitcoin just does Bitcoin. It doesn't hold apps. It just is Bitcoin the asset. Ethereum is an operating system and a developer platform. And that's also what many of the other blockchains are like. Like this is where uh, Pomp, when he was on like Fast Money, talked about like all the other smart contracting platforms that are out there, you know, Ethereum, Solana, like all the other ones. Uh, and so you, you can also gain some assurances, some confidence in whoever you are pitching this to by their ability to be familiar with like the idea of, oh, Bitcoin is separate and it's unique because it's just digital gold. It's just an asset. But Ethereum is an operating system, which is something that you're familiar with and you build apps on it, which is something you're familiar with. And so I think leaning into the operating system that is Ethereum helps embolden the tech platform angle that I think we definitely want with Ether. 
and also I think helps people become more familiar with the landscape of all the entire crypto applications or crypto platforms. I know coming into this, you asked, hey, Brian, do you have a, another one to add to this list of seven? And I, I told you I didn't mm -hmm. have one, but let me just add one now because this is maybe a half step, right? You're just saying rather than just Ethereum is an app store, Ethereum is an app store, it's an operating system as well. Let me give you the full uh, a full step, which is maybe a separate narrative. What about Ethereum as the the internet of value? And this this is kind of like the idea that rather than just an operating system, it's kind of like the internet only for mm -hmm. things that have value. And so it's let it's mo more rough, it's more rugged, it's more you kind of have to surf it and browse it and that sort of thing. Right. And it's permissionless; anyone can deploy to it. I think that is similar to the the app store, but also different because the internet is not just a sandbox you know, constrained by by one company with like this walled garden type of uh, environment, but it's like much more free form. Like anyone can deploy, anyone can expand to it. Mm -hmm. So may maybe that's another narrative that gets us the, the full seven here, David, but it's pretty related to this operating system or app store type of idea, Ethereum, the internet of value. Totally. My commentary on that one would be, it definitely uh, fits and it's a more pure representation and I like it, it's a little more crypto native, but then we've also moved away from familiarity like internet of value is another way to say like operating system that's a little bit more true to what ethereum is but then mm -hmm. you also lose some familiarity and some like pre-existing knowledge and so i think that's something that like a somebody hearing this pitch could get to an aha moment about but i think if i'm just like a 60 you know 60 year old person with like my savings and you're pitching me uh, a blockchain app store versus internet of value i think blockchain app store is going to be a little bit more resonant I, I agree too. Like internet of value feels so amorphous, right? Like what is value right. anyway? That word value, yeah. like um, it's almost like internet of assets might be better, but let's go to number right. four. What's number four? Number four, ETH is digital oil. Now there's there's one of these uh, pitches that I'm going to say we should not definitely do. And there's pros and cons of all of these pitches. And so I'm not going to say that Ethereum is digital oil is like the perfect pitch, but it's definitely worth talking about as a perspective. Uh, especially if we are really looking for that like one liner that e Eric Balchunas was really asking for. If Bitcoin is digital gold, then what is the commodity? What is the resource that Ethereum is? Ethereum is digital oil. It's literally called gas. It is the thing that funds and powers the application that is on Ethereum. When you make a transaction on Ethereum to do some app, some somebody's computers somewhere in the world starts flops it starts doing some flops it actually starts doing some computation and you need to consume ether you need to consume the oil to power those crypto applications uh and so it's it's not perfect because it's going to develop a lot further questions but in terms of just like if we're putting thing, things into like perfect commodity like resources oil i think is the correct comparison for gold so if bitcoin is digital gold then ethereum is digital oil for, for the ETH bulls, it also has this nice property in that it's like a, almost a 7x larger than the uh, total market cap of gold. So gold market cap is about 17 trillion, at least according to this estimate right here. The market cap of oil, if you multiply uh, you know, all the barrels of oil by about $70 per, per barrel, you get 115 trillion. So a lot larger than oil. And, and certainly um, oil being kind of a consumptive good is uh, certainly resonant with the idea of gas. So bigger market cap, mm -hmm. the idea of, of gas, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's not bad. You're not talking about Ethereum, the network in this case, though. You are very mm -hmm. squarely talking about Ether, the asset, or just ETH. Yeah, exactly. And it, it, even though it probably generates further questions and a little bit of confusion in your listener, it at least puts them in the, in the frame of mind as like, well, you know, from, from some perspectives, Ether is meant to be consumed. Like you are supposed to burn ether to use the applications. That that is its purpose. And some people like the productivity and, and the GDP association that that comes with like some crypto asset being uh, being oil. A lot of people don't like the idea of a deflationary asset. Like they have been trained to think that money should inflate. They have been trained to think that uh, an inflation based economy is it produces. Uh, is better producing of value and resources. And so some people just resonate with the idea of oil, I think, more than a, than a gold or a fixed market cap asset. 
It does also, now that uh, Ethereum does have the burn in place, right? It, it does kind of map nicely to you. You have to burn oil in order to get things done and you have to mm-hmm. burn ETH in order to cause movement, cause, you know, pay for transactions on the Ethereum network. Mm-hmm. So that's nice as well. I'll admit that from, for myself, David, I've ebbed and flowed with um, respect to this narrative. Like there are times where I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's right. And other times where I'm like, I hate this narrative. Like this yeah. is worth it. Ethereum's not oil at all. It is a, a non-sovereign store of value in the same way Bitcoin is. Yeah. It's kind of like mm-hmm. a money. It's a, a gone gone back and forth on this but i feel like full cycle when i zoom out and look at the context it's not bad i kind of like this uh ethereum is oil or ether is oil okay we're starting to get into what i would call some of the worst narratives that are still helpful uh and so worse maybe for like presenting ether as a first time to a first timer uh maybe these narratives start to come in further down someone's journey of understanding and worse for tradfi specifically is what you're saying worse for the current audience yeah this is a narrative uh, that we're about to present that I think Bankless, you and I have thoroughly enjoyed, but it has come after just years of like education and perspectives and exploration of what Ethereum is. And that's Ether as an internet bond. If we have the Ethereum stake rate at what is it now, 3.2% for this internet native store value asset that's used as a collateral in DeFi, well, the most risk off thing you can do that's also highly exposed to the crypto economy is buy ETH and stake it. Buy your crypto asset, buy your money, buy your digital oil, whatever, stake it to Ethereum and you get the internet bond. You get the bond, the stake rate of, of ETH. Uh, and since you know Ether, the asset, is the foundation of so many applications in the DeFi landscape, the internet bond is the, the yield rate that transcends all of DeFi. Uh, This one, once again, definitely requires some prerequisite knowledge to really um, make this uh, angle uh, resonant with people. It it definitely also requires understanding what DeFi is and how Ether is a money in DeFi. Uh, But this is one that we've enjoyed. uh, And I know that crypto natives also enjoy it the more that they understand Ethereum as a financial system. Okay, yeah, there, I I also enjoy it, David. So there's lots of good things we could say about it. Like uh, it's definitely a differentiator from Bitcoin, and and uh, the key uh, like uh, ability to stake Ether is kind of much different than than Bitcoin. It's also, you get to comp it to like what's the value of sovereign bonds uh, around the world? Something mm-hmm. like seventy trillion. Okay, and so the idea of Ethereum being sort of like a nation state, only a network state that secures property rights, like we could geek out on that for many episodes of Bankless and indeed we have. So the parallel, the parallels and the analogs are really good here. And so I, I definitely like the Ether as an internet bond for a crypto native audience who's really deeply trying to understand how we're securing property rights inside of these crypto economic systems. That said, I totally agree with you. It is like among the worst narratives to present to uh, TradFi and an ETH buyer, not least of which because they don't get any yield in uh, Ethereum ETF right. right now. Not yet. <laughs> like not yet. all they get is the asset, right? So they can't even mm-hmm. uh, they can't even stake this. And when you say internet bond, what like what do you actually mean? A bond of the internet? Right. Like they're not because a, a uh, bond is supposed to come from a government exactly. or a corporation. Exactly, yeah. and they haven't listened to you know dozens of big uh, <laughs> bankless episodes uh, telling them why, why this is like similar to uh, a you know a nation state yeah. and so it requires too much in, in terms of fundamentals to to easily articulate this to to somebody with wall street knowledge all right second to last i think this one is actually a pretty strong one but again not necessarily something i would lead with programmable money and this i want to note that this tweet is from 2019 this tweet from eric connor he says the original ethereum vision of programmable money is the strongest narrative and the one that will translate best to the mainstream quit looking elsewhere programmable money if if bitcoin is digital gold then ethereum is programmable money uh and the this gets into the idea of like smart contracts and an app store because like you know apps are programs and then ether is the money that goes through the programs uh, it also alludes to the fact that, like, well, there's other crypto assets out there that aren't programmable. Oh, yeah, that's Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin, not programmable. Ether, programmable. Uh, and I don't think this really helps it deliver an all-encompassing vision of Ether or Ethereum. But it does. It's like I think the only way to really get at what is Ether, what is Ethereum, is from is from so many different angles, right? That's why we're talking about seven different angles. And this is a very valid one. This is a very simple one. Uh, you already know Bitcoin. You already know it's a digital asset on the network. It runs on a thing called a blockchain. It's, Ether is the same thing, but it's programmable, implying that Bitcoin's not, and implying that you know you can do things with the programs. 
yeah, I, I, I do like this. It, it does resonate with me. However, I, I feel like it misses something in communicating the ETH narrative um, to the audience, which is like, it doesn't necessarily imply operating system or app mm-hmm. store or right. like platform. When I just hear the term like programmable money in a vacuum without knowing everything that you just said, I might just think it's a, just one mono asset that I can write if then statements on. And like does not necessarily imply that there will be all sorts of different apps and different tokens and different assets and even chains that can be launched on top of this. So it's not, um, I don't think it encompasses the, the full vision of what could, like I would even prefer, I think the, the app store type of uh, analogy to programmable money because it feels much more rich and resonant, e- even if it's not exactly accurate. Yeah. And like I said, I think a full... A full holistic understanding of what Ether is requires all of these narratives, not just like one. We're just kind of going through uh, the ones by by strength. And this is, we're coming up to our number seven, our, the last one, which I think is going to be the weakest narrative, which you should not use. <laughs> and that is ETH is ultrasound money, which has been the funny narrative that the, many in the Ethereum community has used for a long time, including ourselves. And I think it has been a great narrative while the industry understood what sound money was uh, and we would be able to poke fun at, at Bitcoiners. The idea of sound money versus ultrasound money came from a era in crypto in which it was basically just the Bitcoin community and the Ethereum community. Solana hadn't even gone live yet. Like the only, the other Avalanche, uh, yeah, Avalanche was like the other blockchain that was out there and had a community, but very few other communities exist. And ultrasound money was strictly a narrative to counteract Bitcoiner narratives. It was a, a narrative about about the crypto industry for the crypto industry. It was it's supposed to stay insular into the crypto uh, community. So I would not suggest if you're trying to sell ETH to TradFi to BlackRock to your parents, don't call it ultrasound money. They won't no, get it. No, don't. It's, uh, it's super. You know, Pretty 2019, cringe. 2020s yeah. crypto wars, and this this meme sort of came out in 2021 as a reaction to mm-hmm. many in the Bitcoin on the Bitcoin side saying, well, Ethereum is just like you can change the supply at a whim. It's just like fiat. It's just right. like a central bank coin. The, the fact that you stake it, you know, y- even uh, f- is further evidence that this is just like a fiat type of system. And um, you just consume the gas, ETH as gas, um, a- as you go. You don't need to to buy ETH in order to store value. You store your value in, in secure assets, in um, non like store of value assets like Bitcoin and just buy ETH as you need it to pay for compute, right? And so this was when uh, Ethereum's monetary policy was really being uh, hardened and its issuance schedule and like the realization that Ether could be a, a store of value asset, but it's very mm-hmm. insular to the crypto community mm-hmm. and is not, <laughs> not the way to export uh, our narrative to the broader world. 100%. To continue leveling up your crypto game, then you need to get on the Bankless newsletter. It's the world's most popular crypto email and is completely free. Just click below to sign up.